Hello to members and guests to this, our fifth quarantine special. This month we've got a very special guest for you. We've got the lovely Joe Hook, who's a military historian and a battlefield guide, talking to us about Anzac myths. Joe, welcome to Great War Huts. Thank you very much for inviting me to come down here. Great. OK, so, um, so we're talking about Anzac myths and one man above all others who I guess is uh, responsible for, for so many of the Anzac myths is the Australian military uh, official historian, a fellow called Charles Bean. Um, and I think that one of the recurring myths which crops up time and time again is that every soldier in the Australian army was a tall, strapping bushman who, uh, who was a, an incredibly good shot. How accurate do you think Bean's description of the Australian army is? I think it's highly inaccurate. Um, if I can just quote you um, from Bean's volume one of the official history, what he says about the Australians. So he says, the training of the men was never the main difficulty in the Australian Imperial force. The bush still set, sets the standard of personal efficiency, even in the Australian cities. The bushman is the hero of the Australian boy. The arts of the bush life re his ambition. His most cherished holidays are those spent with country relatives or in camping out. He learns something of half the arts of a soldier by the time he is 10 years old. To sleep comfortably in any shelter, to cook meat or bake flour, to catch a horse, to find his way across country by day or night, night or at the worst, to stick on. Um, so firstly, I think what you've got to do is, how do we generalise bushmen? So you have stockmen, you have shearers, you have tree fellers, and what have you. So what is a bushman? Um, so if we take, for example, you can have an Australian who is, lives in the suburbs, but is a tree feller by day. He won't therefore know how to bake flour or build a camp at night because he's going home to his wife who probably cook him his tea. So the actual percentage of um, men who enlisted in 1914 in the Australian Imperial Force that came from, that were true bushmen and came from rural parts of Australia is very, very low. I think it's something like 7%. Um, and certainly statistics far outweigh what Charles Bean says. So if we take the first Australian, the, the first Australian battalion, 7% um, of those men were actual Bushmen. Um, and even if they're Bushmen, are they going to be natural born shots? Who is a natural born shot? Uh, so I think um, when you look at it from that perspective, um, Bean is highly inaccurate. You look at most of the men who enlist, enlist from the suburbs. Uh, the majority of them have jobs that are in offices, factories, their clerks. Uh, so very, very few Australians are actual, truly pro proper uh, Bushmen that we like to th uh, think about. And if you go down through the battalions of 5th Australian Battalion, um, recruiting from Victoria, again, 7% of that battalion uh, is actually men that come from the rural areas that are either sheep shearers or stockmen. Um, and like I said, the 1st Australian Battalion, uh, out of their officers, 
it was only the regimental officer, regimental medical officer, um, who actually came from a rural area. And out of the 975 other ranks, only 70 of those um, could class themselves as true Bushmen. So when we're talking about they were natural born shots, straight out of the bush, blonde, uh, bronze Adonises, I think that's highly inaccurate. Um, doing my research, for example, I have yet to find um, an Australian, or they're very, very few, that are over six foot. The average height um, for the Aus Australian men enlisting in the Australian Imperial Force in 1914 is something like five foot five, five foot six. So again, uh, we've kind of bust that myth straight out of the water, really. <laughs> um, there are still plenty of people that don't know anything at all about the Gallipoli campaign or even where Gallipoli is. And, uh, and even people who have a, an interest in the First World War very often won't know much at all about Gallipoli uh, compared to the battles on the Western Front. But Peter Weir's 1981 film Gallipoli at least brought the story to a, to a fresh audience. Um, and throughout the film, it's, it's pretty obvious that, uh, that the Australians, the, uh, the, the Anzac soldiers are being led, if you like, being commanded by British officers who are portrayed as butchers and bunglers and uh, in very much in the sort of lions led by donkeys vein. Um, and in fact, you see uh, Mel Gibson's character carrying a message, desperately trying to get back to his frontline trench at the neck just before the famous action there. Um, and it, the, the, the inference is that uh, the uncaring British officers are, are sending him and all his mates to their deaths. Um, how accurate do you think the portrayal is of the Australians at Gallipoli in that film? I think it's quite inaccurate. I mean, for a start, um, what a lot of people don't know is, as well as Australians there, there was more British and French that fought at Gallipoli. So that's one um, myth that the film doesn't portray. Um, specifically to do with the Battle of the Neck, um, if I can just explain that the, the soldiers that fought at the Neck were the 3rd Light Horse Brigade. And um, they were meant to uh, fight over a piece of ground that's no bigger than a tennis court in four waves going um, over the top, facing the Turkish army. And what effectively happened as each wave went over, they were literally mown down by Turkish machine gun fire. Now, the two men who were in charge of the 3rd Australian Light Horse Brigade was the brigade commander, whose name is Hughes, together with his brigade major, uh, a gentleman called Anthill. And when um, the fourth wave was going over the top that morning, the 10th Light Horse, the Lieutenant Colonel who commanded the 10th Light Horse was a man called Lieutenant Colonel Brazier. And he knew by literally just looking up with a periscope, seeing the previous waves having gone over, that the Australians were just being mown down. So he does his best to stop the attack. Um, he goes to see Ant Hill, who is the brigade major, who can't find the brigadier, Hughes. Um, and it is just complete chaos. Ant Hill, however, and Hughes, they're both Australian officers. Now, in Peter Weir's fi film, I believe they are depicted as British officers. Um, and what happens is, Ant Hill believes that having looked across the battlefield, he's seen a flag go up. Now, the Australians were meant to take flags with them so that anybody observing the battle could see actually where they, where they were. And he's indignant that this flag has gone up. Um, so he orders the light horse to keep on going. Um, now, what could have happened, that attack could have been stopped. We'd seen it happen before um, at Gallipoli, and we'd seen, we actually see it happen on the Western Front as well. But the film depicts these men being sent over the top by British officers, and actually, Ant Hill and Hughes were both Australian born and bred. However, there are other myths concerning Gallipoli. Um, one that we can go back to relates again to the neck um, and is borne out by Charles Bean again. And this concerns the artillery bombardment prior to the attack. 
The attack is set for 4.30 in the morning and prior to the attack there is a preparatory bombardment. So Australian batteries will bombard the Turkish trenches and from 4am onwards the naval ships will join uh, that preparatory bombardment so it will intensify. However, being on the word of one officer, one officer called Lieutenant Robinson, believes that the guns stopped at 4.23 that morning. And if you read Graham Wilson's book, um, he refutes that completely. And he's done an awful lot of research into this particular time at the Neck, and nothing in any official war diary or any of the official information that came back of the Battle of the Neck has the guns stopping at 4.23 that morning. Yet Bean says quite clearly that they stopped um, as clearly as a knife. What Graham Wilson believes happens, and which I think he probably is correct, is that the Australian batteries and the naval guns knew that the Australian trenches were very, very extremely close to the Turkish trenches. And I mean, if you go to Gallipoli and see the Neck, it is like a tennis court. And to counteract that fact, um, what they did is uh, they overcompensated when they, they fired. So in effect, they actually fired on Turkish second and third line trenches, missing the first line trenches out. So, but Bean um, states that those guns stopped at 4.23. Graham Wilson refutes that and his argument is and he's actually seen the official histories stating the guns were still firing at 4.30 uh, that morning yet Bean's version has been taken on board by virtually every book that's written about Gallipoli every film that's been made about Gallipoli with the guns stopping at 4.23 when in actual fact they I believe that they carried on firing right until zero hour 4.30 that morning and even carried on after that because we see accounts of them firing on the second and third lines of the Turkish trenches. So it looks like Bean's going to crop up quite a bit in this discussion, doesn't it? Um, there's another famous character who crops up in the Gallipoli campaign, another famous Anzac, uh, John Simpson Kirkpatrick, uh, the man with the donkey. Um, what can you tell us about the man with the donkey? Well, for a start, John Simpson Kirkpatrick wasn't an Australian. He was born in South Shields and um, he joined the Merchant Navy, absconded twice from the Merchant Navy and probably used his mother's maiden name. Simpson was his mother's maiden name, so he used that name for fear of being caught, having absconded from the Merchant Navy. And when he arrived, at Gallipoli as part of the Royal Army Medical Corps or Royal Australian Army Medical Corps. He um, supposedly uh, found one donkey. Now this donkey has got various different names, Abdul, Duffy, Murphy, and he would bring the wounded down on this donkey. And the myth is that he managed to save 300 wounded or brought 300 wounded down to the casualty clearing station which was on Anzac Cove. Now if you look at the fact that um, John Simpson was killed in May 1915 uh, to bring 300 wounded down, you know they only landed on the Anzac Cove on the 25th of April, that donkey would have had to been going sort of like about 300 miles an hour. Um, and was it one donkey? It's believed that he had a number of donkeys um, and that actually he didn't save uh, 300 lives. He just did not have the time to. He would have been the busiest man on Gallipoli. And whilst we know that he did bring wounded down, not as many as 300, you know, there were lots of brave actions at Gallipoli. But I think it's the, the thing that people identify with this you know, man nurturing the casualties, the donkey, and almost has a bit of a religious feel to, to it. And so gradually, uh, the myth of John Simpson has grown up. Um, I think there is some truth to it, but certainly he didn't save 300 casualties. And again, we have to bring Charles Bean into the, the picture. He, he put him on this kind of pedestal. And Charles Bean cites two private soldiers, Private Dyke, 
who wasn't even on Gallipoli, and another private called Private Lowe's, um, who claimed he was wounded and had been saved by Simpson, and we know Private Lowe's wasn't wounded. So, again, it's what started off, I think, as a story, has grown and grown, and Charles Bean has elaborated it until it's become mythical proportions. While we're on the subject of four-legged animals, there's a, a story that always crops up uh, from the end of the war about how the men of the Australian light horse were so worried that the war office were going to sell all their horses to the locals and they were really worried that they were going to be badly mistreated, that they took them all out into the desert and shot them. Um, is there any truth in that? In a word, no. The AIF in 1918 had uh, roughly 11,000 horses and 8,000 of those were given back to the British Army to use. And of the other 2,000, there was quite a controlled method about how they dealt with their horses. So any horse that was over 12 years old or that if it required veterinary treatment, needed more than two months of veterinary treatment, was humanely destroyed. There is no question that the Australians were very fond of their horses, and there's a Lieutenant Colonel Alden, um, and he quotes, Our horses became so much part of us throughout the campaign that most of us cherished the belief that they would go back to Australia and civilian blessedness after the war. However, it is not to be, and soon after we arrived in Tripoli, an order was received to the effect that only a small percentage of the best horses would be retrained for service in imperial units, and the remainder would be destroyed. When this instruction became known, a distinct sadness descended upon the camp, everyone being deeply affected. A few days later, in an atmosphere both gloomy and pensive, the veterinary staff arrived to classify and shortly afterwards in order to destroy the order to destroy was carried out now they classified them so in effect if the animal was older than 12 then they were humanely destroyed or if it needed a certain period of veterinary treatment but there is no truth whatsoever that the australians shot their own horses and had any veterinary officer agreed to do that, he would have had to have gone through a disciplinary procedure. So where does that myth come from? Um, there was a gentleman called Major Hogue, and he was a journalist. He, he wrote for the Sydney Morning Herald, and, and so the Australians need a good story. He wanted to become a war correspondent, um, but couldn't be, for whatever reason, couldn't become a war correspondent, and enlisted in the light horse. And before he um, went back to England, where he died at the end of the war, he penned a poem, and this is his poem. He said, In days to come, we'll wander west and cross the range again. We'll hear the bush birds singing in the green trees after rain. We'll come through the mitchell grass and breast the bracing wind. But we'll have other horses. Our chargers stay behind. Around the fire at night, we'll yarn about old Sinai. We'll fight our battle o'er again, and the days go by. There'll be old mates to greet us, the bush girls will be kind. Still our thoughts will often wander to the horses left behind. I don't think I could stand the thought of my old fancy hack, just rolling around old Cairo with a jippo on his back. Perhaps some English tourist out in Palestine may find my broken-hearted whaler with a wooden plough behind. No, I think I'd better shoot him and tell a little lie. He floundered in a wombat hole and then lay down to die. Maybe I'll get court-martialed, but I'm damned if I'm inclined to go back to Australia and leave me horse behind. Now, those horses couldn't go back, and that's a, a known fact. They couldn't go back for a number of reasons. It would cost them too much. They would have to be put into quarantine because going back to a rural um, country. But certainly, um, they weren't taken out and shot by their own troopers. Um, they were dealt with in the best way 
that the Australian Imperial Force could deal with them. Those, um, the, the rest, I said there was 11,000 taken out, 8,000 um, were given to the British. Um, those others that weren't humanely destroyed, they couldn't be sold to the Arab market at all because there was no call for horses. Horses were far too expensive. So the Arab market, there was a call, sure, for camels and mules and donkeys, but definitely not horses. And I think the poem that uh, Oliver Hogue wrote, it got taken up by the um, Light Horses Association magazine, uh, called the Kia Ora Kui. It was widely read by the men of the light horse and widely read in Australia as well. So again, it's gone down through the years and, and you can imagine old light horsemen, you know, talking to their grandchildren, oh, what happened to the horses in the grandchildren, granddad? And you go, well, let me tell you a story about the whalers. And so that myth has progressed and I get asked all the time, oh Joe, they shot the horses, didn't they? And it's no, they didn't. They actually dealt with them in the best way they possibly could do. We've spoken about uh, senior officers in other questions and um, the whole lions led by donkeys nonsense and the butchers and bunglers myths are, are, are bound up in so much uh, duff history about the First World War. But looking specifically at the officers of the Australian Imperial Force, right from platoon commanders to corps commander. Um, how do you think they compared with their British counterparts? That's an interesting question, because I think when you look at any large organisation, whether it be an army, a factory or a supermarket or anything, you have good managers and not so good managers and bad managers. And this was no different for the Australian Imperial Force. Certainly there were some very, very good officers. Um, there were some not so good officers. And then there was quite a few that shouldn't have been commissioned at all. In comparison to the British Army, I think the British Army was the same. There were some very good officers. There were some very not so good officers and some that really shouldn't have been commissioned. But when we look at the Australian Imperial Force. So, for example, on the Western Front, uh, the first battle concerning the Australians was the 5th Australian Division. Their divisional commander is a man called Mackay, and Mackay is very much wanting his division to be blooded, uh, the first division to be blooded on the Western Front. And um, for those of you who are not aware of what happened, they attacked at Fromelles. It was the worst day in Australian military history. They lost 5,530-odd Australians in the space of 24 hours. And after the battle, when they were clearing the uh, casualties from the battlefield, the Germans actually came up and offered a truce, and Mackay refused this. Um, with half his men dead or dying on the battlefield, he could have agreed um, to this truce. Um, but his only excuse for that was that he had ordered, been ordered not to agree to it from high command. And a lot of people have questioned uh, Mackay about this. And certainly in 1917, when we look at uh, Bullcor, the Battle of Bullcor, a battle that's uh, very close to my heart because it's what I did my MA dissertation in, um, we're looking at General Holmes. Uh, General Holmes commanded the 4th Division um, and there was... It literally, that first uh, battle was a catalogue of errors. And one could say that the army commander, so who Goff would report up the chain of command to, Goff was in the wrong. But in my opinion, um, he doesn't bear the main re uh, responsibility for what went wrong in this battle. And a lot of it has to fall down onto Holmes, who was at the, at the kind of tactical level on the field. Um, when we look at 15th Brigade, Australian 15th Brigade, their brigade commander is a man called Pompey Elliott, a, a larger-than-life character, really. Um, but he, at Fromel, when his brigade was virtually um, annihilated, reports are that he was so distraught he was in floods of tears. Yet you can also read reports about Elliott threatening to shoot men for not going forward. And I think if we looked at him today, he would possibly be bipolar, he committed suicide after the First World War. 
There were some very good officers as well, in my opinion, and I was having a chat with somebody about this the other day, Gellibrand, who commands uh, one of the brigades of the 4th Australian Division, certainly he makes mistakes, and I think everybody in warfare makes mistakes. We learn a lot of the time by the mistakes we made, but I think he was an extremely good leader. Um, he, at, at Bulcor, when he fought at Bulcor with his brigade, um, he had his brigade headquarters right on the ground where he had situational awareness of what was going on. As compared to the other brigade commander who would, who would fight alongside him at Bulcor was a guy called Smith, had his brigade headquarters some two miles to the rear, had no situational awareness of what was happening, and his brigade did very, very poorly as compared to Gellibrand's. But when we compare them with the, with the uh, British troops, I don't think, or British officers, I don't think there's a lot of difference. I think throughout the BEF, Canadians, Australians and British forces, there was excellent, there was good, there was not so good, and then there was those that shouldn't have been commissioned at all. One Australian officer that we could probably all agree was, was pretty good um, was Sir John Monash, who, who commanded the Anzac Corps. Um, and... It's often said that he invented all arms warfare in 1918 and, uh, and very recently um, we've seen appeals at uh, the end of the centenary uh, in Australia that say that uh, he should be given a posthumous promotion to field marshal. What do you think about that? In my opinion, I don't think we can say that he invented all arms warfare. Uh, Monash at Gallipoli was a brigade commander, uh, made quite a few mistakes as all of us do when we're on that kind of learning curve. And then he first came out onto the Western Front as divisional commander for the 3rd Australian Division. And this would be the first time the 3rd Australian Division would fight during the Battle of Messines. Battle of Messines planned by a man called General Plumer. Now, Plumer used artillery. He used tanks. He used infantry, all combined together, supporting each other. And Monash was very much a disciple of Plumer's. And so a year later in 1918, when Monash as Anzac Corps commander at that time is given the task of arranging the battle at Le Hamel, what he's doing is he's really taking what Plumer had already done, tweaking it a bit, so he's using air power, Plumer used air power, um, discussions with UTAF, we've talked about parachutes being dropped onto a battlefield prior to Le Hamel. And as we discussed earlier, Monash was the man who was really in the right place and the right time. And I'm not saying in any way trying to um, say what he didn't do was excellent. He tweaked it and in actual fact, during the Battle of Le Hamel, he likened it to an orchestra. So an orchestra should have all its different parts, its brass, its percussion, its woodwind. He was an excellent planner. You can't take that away from him, but very similar man um, to Plumer. Should he be given a uh, retrospective promotion to field marshal? No, I don't think he should have done. Uh, there's many that will say he's the only man that was knighted in the field. He wasn't the only officer that was knighted in the field. And I think if you give him a retrospective promotion, where do you draw the line on other, you know, commander's heart just as good? So Monash, I think he, what he did in 1918, his all arms combined warfare, what he tweaked, let's say, would be taken as the method to be used for the end of the war. But it, he didn't invent it. All those different things that were used during the Battle of Le Hamel, um, the artillery fire plan, the tanks supporting the infantry had already been used in their own way together. Monash was the man to pull it together. And the question I would almost put back to you, if Monash hadn't have done it, I'm sure somebody else would have done it almost in exactly the same fashion. I couldn't agree more. And I'm afraid that's where we have to leave it this month. So I'd just like to say a huge thanks to Joe for being our guest today. It's my absolute pleasure. And all that remains to do is to thank you all very much indeed for watching. Uh, and just a reminder that uh, we'd like you all to subscribe to the Great War Hut's YouTube channel. And uh, we shall see you all next month. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.